five office hours for the entire month, for the entire month of June, I'm giving away free career and job search advice, and I am so thrilled to have you. Today, I have got a great little show for you on the resume. And in particular, we're gonna talk about the career profile, and I'll explain what that is, and the five key pieces of information you have to have in that career profile to make it sing and make it noticeable. Before we go into any of that, I wanna introduce myself. My name's Andy LaCivita, and I'm the founder of Mile Walk and the Mile Walk Academy and the award-winning author of The Hiring Prophecies and Interview Intervention. And I have made it my mission in life to help people succeed in their careers, and I've been doing it a very, very long time. Mile Walk is my executive search firm where we support organizations to help them find great resources. And the Mile Walk Academy is my training site where I teach on three different topics, everything careers related and uh, uh, everything careers related and, and, and personal development for individuals and hiring for, organiza for organizations. Now all that information, my contact info, links to the blog, links to my training site, all that good stuff, social sites, that's all in the live stream description. And also in the description, this week, this is our third live office session. The first couple had aids on job interviewing, ebooks and webinars on job interviewing. Today, since we're talking about the resume, I have got some great stuff in there. I have free resume templates, which I think, based on the number of people that download them every month, I can call them famous templates now. I have one for the professionals and I have one for the college students, so you're welcome to take those. There's also a video tutorial on my YouTube channel that'll help you kind of walk through that. And I also have, and I am really, really geeked up about this, I have a brand spanking new 52 minute free webinar on how to get your resume noticed. It's called Three Secrets to Get Your Resume Noticed. I just released it last night. I know a bunch of people have already watched it, so if you are with me on this session and you've watched it, I hope you enjoyed it. And I also, I also am doing everything resumes related this week because uh, in a, on Wednesday next week, I have a live workshop for my resume course, so I'm, I'm, I'm really into the resume today. So I hope you check all that stuff out. Now, before we go into the content about the career profile, I wanna let you know what that is if you're not familiar. And I also, I also want to give you some context around why it's so important. So if you, are not, if you are not familiar with what a career profile is, it's simply a Reader's Digest version or executive summary of your entire career or, or the portion of your career you want to highlight for the types of companies and positions or careers that you're targeting, and it belongs at the top of the resume. Now, it is really, really important that you understand the value that this couple sentences, couple paragraphs can bring you, because if you are sending your resume out and you are not getting callbacks and you are not getting job interviews, it's likely your resume is the problem. If you're getting the job interviews and you're not getting the job offers, it's probably your job interviewing skills. But let's just assume we wanna help you get a, a, a high octane resume. So, but before we talk about the content that should go into a career profile, I wanna, I wanna show you why it's so important and in order for you to get noticed, you need to, know, you need to understand how people notice you. When somebody looks at your resume, what are, how are they looking at it? What are they looking for? And I think once you have an appreciation of that, I think you'll, you'll, you'll be able to better package it so that you know where to place things, what to put there, and so on. So what I wanna do is I took one slide from that new webinar that I released last night, Three Secrets to Get Your Resume Noticed. I took one slide out of those 52 minutes and I wanna walk you through exactly what's happening when somebody opens your resume. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk you through it. So I'm gonna see my little video production skills here. Hopefully I can make this uh, cut over. Uh, yeah, looks like everything is okay. So this is a slide that I, I'm using in that webinar to give folks context around what's happening when somebody opens their resume. Now keep in mind, somebody's probably opening it electronically and 
they're either looking at it inside of an applicant tracking system or a lot of these people are opening one email after another and, and simply opening your attachment. So here's what's, here's what's actually happening. The resume itself is popped up. Hey, look at that guy. Don't, don't model your resume after this. This is a, an old one of mine and I've, I've since made many, many improvements. But for illustrative purposes, and I didn't want to uh, put anybody on the spot, I just I, I put my name up there as a very old resume of mine. So when the resume opens and they're likely looking at the first page, the first place that my eyes go are the top center. I'm just looking for your name. I just I just want to see your name. I don't want to see a whole bunch of letters and numbers and other things and hieroglyphics after your name. I just want to know whose resume I'm reviewing. And this is the first place my eyes look is the top center. If you make me look to the left or the right, while it sounds ridiculous and you might think I'm a nutcase, but you're making me work harder than I have to. And the one thing that I want you to understand is as I as I breeze through how I look at a resume, what you need to understand is you are likely one of 300 resumes that somebody is looking at. So what they're doing is they're trying to bulk up their time and they're trying to simply go through the resumes as quickly as they can to determine which pile to put you in. Is this the pile I'm going to put it in because I want to look at it a little later? Or is it going to go in the, hey, I'm not, I'm not going to bother with this resume pile. So that's the first place I look. The second place that I look is the entire top half of the first page of what should be a no longer than two page resume. So when you when you stack your resume and, and you're 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 looking at the most prime real estate folks, this is your headline. This is the second place somebody's eyes go to. Think about the billboards, think about your commercials, think about if you're in marketing, grabbing somebody's attention. That's what needs to happen in this portion of the, in, in the entire resume, but especially in this portion because it sets the tone for how they look at the rest of the resume. Are they excited to glance through the rest of this and are they going to look forward to actually looking at it in its entirety? Then what I do is I look down the left column. So I don't look at the body. I didn't read the top here. I didn't, I didn't read any of this. I simply glanced at it. And I want to know, did the person provide me evidence? Did they give me indications of what it was that they did? Did they highlight accomplishments, whether tangible or intangible, as it relates to the benefits and the value that they contributed? Or did they give me opinions of themselves? Things like, I'm a leader. I'm organized. You know, I'm very detailed. You want to stay away from things like that because those are your opinions of yourself. And what people are looking for is, is the individual providing me evidence of the fact that they are impactful? So I, 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 want, I want to make sure that you understand it. Then when I drop down here and I look at the left column, really all I'm looking for is what companies has this person worked for? So have they worked for well uh, pedigreed organizations. They don't have to be household names. They don't have to be large Fortune 500 companies. They just need to be leaders in their space or organizations that have a reputation for being good. And I want to know where you worked and that's more important to me personally than specifically the titles and the jobs that you've held. So I look at where you worked. I look down the left column and then I swing over to the left, second page and I just want to know is the page laid out in a manner that looks like it has the information that I need and that I would be interested in looking at this resume? This takes me five seconds to do. It, it, it might even take me less and it'll, it probably it'll takes me less if I have a lot to look at. Now, if you don't want to take my word for this, I've mentioned to you, we run surveys annually on things like this. How do people hire? How do people look at resumes? I've put surveys out to thousands and thousands of HR and recruiting professionals to actually ask them how they look at a resume. How long do they look at a resume? What do they look for in a resume? This, what you're seeing, this picture here is an aggregation of my techniques and what, what the market is doing. So for just for a few minutes, as you start to write your resume, think about what am I going to provide this individual who is likely inundated 
with many, many resumes. And even if you are a specialist, even if there's only 10 of you in the world that do what you do, the person who is reviewing the resumes for your particular position probably has 15 or 20 other positions that he or she is evaluating resumes for. So the bigness of what that particular person's job is, you need to consider as you lay this, as you lay this resume out. Now, I'd like to swing back. Now, you got an idea of how somebody looks at your resume. Now I want to talk about why that career profile is so important. So you're setting the tone. You are giving them, you are positioning them. You are about to serve yourself up and you want to give them an impression of who you are. You want to announce your presence in a bold fashion. And it doesn't matter to me if you're a six month veteran or a five decade veteran, the goal of the career profile is to aggregate your bigness and give the person a summary of what they are about to read and get them excited about your past so that the next several seconds of their future is going to be a happy one. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that there's five pieces of information that need to go in it. The first two things that I want to talk about aren't even aren't even those five. I just I want to mention this is an aggregation of either your entire career or the portion of your career that you want to highlight. So by aggregation, I mean if you've been working 20 years in the retail space, you can say I am a 20 I am an experienced 20 year professional in the large retail space and so on. That's what I mean by aggregation. If you want to get out of retail and you've got some healthcare experience and you would rather highlight that and you don't want to mention all your other retail experience, you can do that as well. I have 20 years of work experience, most recently five years in the healthcare industry or something like that. That's what I'm talking about, but it's an aggregation. That's the first thing that you want to understand. The second thing is it only needs to be two paragraphs. That could be two sentences or it, it could be one paragraph if you want of two sentences or it could be three or four sentences. How you package those sentences is ultimately up to you. But the pieces of information that I want you to include are how many years of total experience or how many years of relevant experience that you have. That's, that's number one. So I'm a 20 year vet or I'm a 10 year, you know, I'm a 20 year vet with 10 years of healthcare experience. So that's, that's number one. The second thing that I want you to include are the types of companies that you've worked for. I've worked for small startups. I've worked for mid-sized companies. I worked for large organizations, large privately held, large publicly held. I've worked for various size companies from small to large, but some type of indication of where you've been as well as the industries. So number three, the industries that you've worked in, healthcare, uh, financial services, insurance, whatever, whatever it might be. And if it's many different industries, you can say various industries such as healthcare, pharmaceutical, manufacturing, and so on. So that's number three. Number four, your accomplishments. So I'm not talking about a blow by blow detail of what it is that you've done. I'm just talking about in general, if you are a salesperson, and I'm going to glance here at the chat because I asked you all to kind of chime in uh, on the chat. Okay, Michael, Michael is a senior sales executive. So this is a great one. Has he, he has sold uh, products or services and how much he sold, maybe how many clients he's sold to, or if he doesn't know the number of clients he sold to in his life, he might want an average number of clients per year or something like that. That is an accomplishment. I am a senior sales executive who has sold and managed $20 million in the whatever industry. That's what I'm talking about. So you wanna make sure that you're giving some accomplishments in that profile. And then the fourth, or sorry, the fifth thing that you want to include is you also want to include some core competencies. Now, one thing that I want you to be careful of when you include your competencies, specifically, I'm talking about the business functions that you have performed in your life. So if you, I think I saw uh, somebody was in here was a marketing, Dan. Dan is a marketing director. So in Dan's case, here you go, Dan. Here's one for you. Uh, 
you know, what kind of marketing have you done? So I am a seasoned marketing professional who has worked for large Fortune 500 companies and so on. Experience includes content marketing, you know, direct marketing, event marketing, and so on. Those are your core competencies. And the only thing that I want to caution you when you have those competencies is listing them, is list them in a sentence so that you're taking up this much of the top portion of your resume. Don't list them in columns. People hate lists. All you're doing with listing in a sentence, your core competencies is you're shaping the person's mind as what business functions you have experience in. But you do not need to take up a ton of, you don't need to take up two inches with you know, four columns of five competencies. Just pick the six or eight big ones or two or three big ones or whatever it is and just list them up. Experience includes marketing related to content, uh, direct, and so on. That's what I'm talking about. If you are an accountant, I think I saw somebody, David's an accountant. I think we have a couple of accountants on here. Who else did I see in here that was an account? There were a few of them. But, you know, are you, are you bookkeeping? Are you a closer? Are you know? Are you are you uh, internal accountant, external accountant? You know, what portions of uh, accounting or finance are you doing? Are you in mergers and acquisitions, or are you managing the internal books? If you're in public accounting, what types of companies uh, have you worked for? So you've developed public accounting skills related to. So those are the kind of things I'm talking about. So I just want to recap them really quick, and then I'm gonna op- I'm gonna open this up for questions, and we could. We could talk for the next half an hour or so on your specifics if you'd like or anything related to your job search. So number one, you want to make sure that you are including in in aggregate your years of experience or your relevant experience that you want to highlight. The second thing that you want to do is you want to highlight the types of companies that you've worked for and the industry. And the third thing is the industries that you've worked for. You also want to include number four, the accomplishments at a very rolled up level because the body of your resume and, and the highlight section are going to include some detailed breakdowns of your roll up. And then the fifth thing is your core competencies. So what business functions are you skilled in? So I hope that helps. That gives you an idea when somebody's looking at your resume, what are they looking for? What does the top portion of your resume do? One other thing before we open up for questions that I really want to stress, and any of you that have followed me know how much I hate this. So I I, I, I would never talk about resumes without throwing this in. The career profile up top shows what you've done and it gets the person thinking about the value you can contribute. That's what you offer. That's why you want it up top. What you do not want up top are an objective statement. An objective statement has no place on a resume. None. Speak it. Don't ever write it. You, if That's the first thing that I see from you is what you want from me. I'm going to just pitch it in the garbage. So you want to show what you offer, not what you want. The second thing you don't want to do is you don't want to admit the summary because when I open up the resume, you saw that graphic, I look at the name, you probably have your name there, but if you go right into your work experience, I have no context. I have no context of what I'm about to read. I want to imagine, even for a few seconds, what I am about to go through. And I want it to be positive. I don't want it to be negative. So I have to start with, okay, well, where's he work or where's she work? And then I have to kind of fight through the resume to, to make and build my own context. Build it for me. Build it for the person who's opening up your resume. That's really, really important. Those are the two biggest mistakes that people make. So I hope you help that, or I hope that helps you. I'm happy to, to take some questions and, uh, And and before we do that, I just want to reiterate, there are actually three ways for you to get resume help from me. On my YouTube channel, there are a number of videos related to the resume. I talk a lot about tips and tricks and things that you ought to do. That's all free. There's a playlist, in fact. I put it so you go binge watch to your heart's desire. I also have that free webinar that I just released last night. It's 52 minutes. It's called Three Secrets to Get Your Resume Noticed. And you got a little glimpse as to what I show you in that webinar. And then the third thing, which I'm super excited about, is my course, which also comes with attendance in the live monthly workshop. So I have a Build Your Ultimate Professional Resume course that 
is always available, but once a month we have a live workshop where people attend and we kind of go through things and we have a powwow and I, I teach the live instruction and we also do a, a specific Q&A on their resumes and other things that they need with their job search. That workshop is June 14th, is next Wednesday. So you've got an opportunity to enroll in that if you want and you want to attend that live session. One thing I'm going to throw out right now, I know Kara hates it when I do this, uh, but I'm in a real given mood today so I'm going to be giving away courses. If you, if anybody, before I hang up, before we end the stream, enrolls in the resume course and the workshop, I will throw in my interview intervention course, which is an awesome interviewing course from my first book. I brought my first book, Interview Intervention, to life. In there is a job interviewing methodology that in the last three years, statistically people who have engaged in that have outperformed other job seekers by 560 percent and if you want to know how i came up with that number you just ask me but i will throw that in for free it's a 200 hundred dollar course it is everything you'd ever want to know about interviewing so for you any of you that are on here there's a link in the description you can you can enroll in it and anybody out in the world who's not watching this who happens to enroll before i hang up they can have that too so Anyway, so let's let's go to questions. I am dying to see these questions. So who's here? We got Michael, David, Zainab. I think that's how you pronounce your name. Kara's here. She's always here helping me. K Bot, uh, you are welcome. Let's see. Is that Lane? I don't know if that's Lane or Ian Baker. David again. Dan, Stephen, Melva, Elizabeth, Lasalle, Stephen. Okay, let's see. Questions, folks, questions. I know you guys were having some problems with the stream. Everything is green on my end. Let me see. I'm just working through here. All good. Rob Zelenka, hey, how are you? Got your email. I appreciated that. Melanie, great to see you, Tarek. Hey, that's great. Everybody's back. Oh, zip down. Sorry, this list is long. All right. Juan. Rob, okay, it, Kara, let me know. I've got Rob Zelenka, and I've got a question from him, and it looks like the questions start there. Is that right? Just slack me, let me know. Okay, Rob, Rob is first, okay, great. We are good to go. Hey, by the way, I, I am on, I just poured my first cup of coffee at 11 o'clock, so if I'm talking a little slower than normal, that's why. Okay, Rob, how do you represent your experience in two pages when you've had many short stints, two to three years each, over a 25 year period? Typically, I see this leads to adding a third page to a resume. Okay, folks, and Rob, that is an awesome question. Uh, it is a fantastic question. Actually, you guys always hit me with great questions, but I know a lot of you struggle with trying to reduce the resume to two pages. And trust me when I can tell you, if I can take my 29 year career and jam it into 26 words, you can get a 25 year career into two pages. So here's a couple of things that you can do to optimize the real estate. Number one, don't do anything that doesn't add value, meaning don't have lists that are this long and tables and those kind of things that take up a lot of real estate. Second thing is, when you have 25 years of work experience, so anybody out there who has, say, 20 years of experience or up to 50 years of experience, I got an email yesterday from somebody 71 years old, and she is going strong. So anybody, let's say, in those in that range, you tend to fall victim to, you know, you're not, not getting it down to two pages. So the first thing is look and make sure you're not using or you're not wasting any real estate with tables and silly silliness like that or objective statements or anything like that. Then I start from the bottom and what you should do, I'm a fan, now you, 25 years only is, so you're you know in your late 40s let's say, and you've got all that work experience. I want to see all that work experience on the resume, so include it all. When you get down to, the, to the, uh, your first job or your second job or whatever it is, you can start to compress the amount of text you're using to describe what it is that you did. So while I like to know what you did 25 years ago, I don't need this much information on that. I only need one sentence. So I'm gonna give you a great example. 
I had the good fortune of working for Anderson Consulting when I came out of school. It's now Accenture. It's a very large uh, consulting firm. I spent 10 years there uh, in, my first, in my first job. If I was to put a resume together, this is how much room I need to articulate Anderson Consulting now doing business as Accenture. Uh, sold and managed large scale information technology uh, and business process management solutions ranging from 5 million to 50 million managing team sizes of 5 to 500. Boom, that's it, two, two lines. And so you want to compress the stuff that is well in your past. Now, I had 10 years and can do that and can, can trim it down. You might, you might be out there thinking, okay, well, hang on a second. In my first 10 years, I had five jobs. So if you're a 50-year-old and you've got you know 25 years or 28 years of experience and you've got five jobs in your first 10 years that I'm not gonna care so, so much about, you might want to just put a, a section that says, you know, uh, worked for various Fortune 500 companies between you know 1985 and 1995 that included you know and what the names are and what you did and you can group companies together that is okay if it's well in your past and it isn't going to give a lot of, of value uh, or or concern to somebody who's far more interested in let's say your last 10 or 15 years. So that's, a, that's another second or third thing that you can do. The fourth thing that I would do is you probably are putting in too many bullets on each role or within each company. You probably can put half as much as you think you can. That's another way to trim it. All right, so Rob, I hope that helps. And if it doesn't, you get in my workshop and we'll work on it. There's actually, a um, in the workshop, there is a, an option for me to do a video resume review for you. So after you go through the program, you put your resume together, you send it over to me, and then I highlighted it, and I make suggested edits, and I create a video for you. It's, it's super cool. I mean, it's super cool. All right, let's see, Oscar. I think Oscar is the next one. Oscar Cat Gomez, how are you? Thank you for coming. What is the key concept we can use in our resume when we want to move from one industry to quite a different one? Okay, Oscar, awesome question. For you and, and for, for Oscar and for all of you out there who are either looking for a job without skills, meaning, hey, I'm just, I'm a college student, man, I'm looking for my first job, or you know, I want to change industries and I've been working for a couple years and I just want to shift over from that to that, but I don't have the, the requisite experience. Or I've been working for 10 or 15 or 20 years and I just want to make a wholesale change. All of you, believe it or not, fall into the exact same category. You have to put a resume together where you don't have the requisite job skills. So one of the things that you need to understand when organizations are very good, very strong organizations. They look for cultural fit. They look for what's called capabilities, or this is my vernacular, but capabilities and achievements. And I'll explain what those are and why I'm, why I'm going through this for you and why I'm giving you this context. So I don't know if you know this, but in the Hiring Prophecies, which is my most recent book, I laid out for the world my hiring methodology. This is a, a little snippet of it but of the many, many years of research that I did and gathering data and surveys and monitoring and all kinds of stuff, I discovered that the most effective organizations look for cultural fit first, they look for capabilities second. Capabilities is your demonstrated capacity to perform a function without having previously done it, okay? Achievements is third. Achievement is that track record. Is this individual is his or her career rising? Have they made good decisions? Uh, have, have, they, have they done well, even if it's in a different industry? And then the fourth thing they look for are particular skills, but that's a distant fourth. Poor companies, companies that do not do very well, and I'm making generalizations here, so don't tell me about how your company is so great and it does this, but that's okay. Companies who do not hire effectively, 
place greater weight on the job experience, the specific experience that the person has been there and done that before, and they, they stray away from some of the other leading indicators of whether or not that person is going to be a successful employee. Okay, why did I tell you that? Because if you are interviewing with a good organization, they're going to be looking for more than just your particular job experience. They're going to be looking for your capabilities. So what did I mean by that? Capabilities, a demonstrated capacity to do something that you have not yet done. So I think we saw, I saw some, pro, there's a program director, there's some project managers out here and things like that. And Oscar, I don't know what your function is, but, but follow me. If you are a team leader or a manager of people and you run some projects, but you haven't yet managed a project in a particular field, if you've got good client relationship building skills and organizational skills and people management skills and those kind of things, those are capabilities. So they're not specific to the job. Being specific to the job is you having project managed financial services projects related to fund management. That's what I'm talking about. So that's a very specific skill set, but leadership skills other capabilities like organization, critical thinking, your leadership skills, and those other elements are more important. So why do you need to know that? The first thing you need to do, so here, here's your formula. If you wanna make a change or you wanna get a job in a company in a position that you don't have experience, first thing you need to do is you need to think about why you want that particular career and you need to make sure that you understand it. Second thing you need to do is figure out what are the capabilities that make for a good person or an employee in that role. So as an example, a salesperson, if you want to move into sales, well, salespeople, the most effective ones, are excellent communicators. They're great listeners. They've got great leadership and influencing skills. They, they also know how to paint a picture and tell a story so that they can, when they're working with their customers, they can figure out what their customer wants and show them exactly how their products or their services map to that. Well, all of those skills that I just highlighted, you could gain those types of skills without having been a salesperson. So on your resume, you need to highlight the capabilities that you think are important to make that change in your career and show the company or the reviewer how you have the leadership skills, the listening skills, the communication skills, the influential skills, and so on. And that is the stuff that you need to be putting on your resume and bringing to the top of your resume in the highlights. And some. I'm not going to go through the whole resume today, but below the career profile is a highlight section. And you could put in those highlights some of the uh, ways in which you developed these uh, capabilities uh, by the things that you've done in whatever job that it is that you've had. If you're a student and you're looking for your first job, what school projects did you have? What volunteer work did you do? What part-time jobs did you have where you picked up these kind of skills? If you're an engineering student and you don't have any engineering internships and you know you were parking cars or selling clothes or doing whatever you could do to make, make ends meet while you went through college and now you're looking for your first job, you have to take the capabilities from those school projects, the lab work you've done, the part-time jobs and so forth and start highlighting your capabilities like critical thinking, analysis skills, design skills, and whatever it might be. So in short, you have, with that new career or with that first job or with that job change, what are the capabilities? What have you done in your past that you can highlight where you can actually, where you can actually show that you have those capabilities and you, you can demonstrate that you've built those qualities in it and, and the skills are the easiest thing for the company to teach you. So we have an expression that it's easier to teach the trade than the traits. So if you've got the leadership skills and the organizational skills and, and, and you are detail-oriented and you do have that energy and that attitude and all that good stuff, that's harder for me to teach you than it is how to manage a project or how to sell a particular product. So I hope, I hope that helps and I hope I... I wasn't too long-winded there, but I think it's important that you have that context and why that's important to highlight those capabilities. All right, Tariq, I am an IT pro. Okay, that's funny. All right, 
Let me see. I'm just trying to look through here, folks, just looking for the questions. All right, I am who just got, how? Okay. Amarichi. I'm helping an accountant who just got his MBA in healthcare administration with his resume. How can he write his summary related to his interest in changing careers? Okay, I'm going to refer you to what I just mentioned, and I have a few other things specifically for you. So that is a fantastic question. So I'm helping an accountant who just got his MBA in healthcare administration with his resume. How can he write his summary related to his interest in changing careers? So number one, for any of you who are getting a higher degree or any secondary education of any kind, if you are getting a master's, a PhD, if you're going to get your paralegal degree or anything like that, if you're looking to make a shift, one of the things that you can do is you can highlight that up top. So in your career profile, he wants to uh, find out, or whoever this individual is that you're helping, the accountant, he's, he's gained some skills as being an accountant that will transfer over to administration. There's no question, he's probably organized, methodical, all that good stuff. Those are things I would bring into the top. I would also mention in the profile, recent graduate, recent MBA graduate, it's okay to say that. Recent MBA graduate in healthcare administration, people are gonna know that you or he went to school to make a shift or at least to accelerate his career. So you wanna include his educational uh, work. And even in the profile, if he did something very special project-wise, MBAs are very, very good uh, tools and, and great, great sources of experience for the projects that you have to do and they try to simulate real life. Highlight some of those in the career profile and in the highlight section. So I think, uh, I, and, and then obviously what I just mentioned to Oscar about making sure that you're clear on what those capabilities are uh, is, a really great, is a really great way to go. So I hope that helped. All right, who's here? Who else? Melvin, I'm a 27-year IT vet. Should I wait to get my resume perfect or just toss it out there? At every resume revision, I feel more confident, but at the same time, don't think is it, it is as good as it can be. Hmm. Melvin, that's a fantastic question. And for all of you perfectionists out there, so Melvin, I'm not calling you a perfectionist, but if all you perfectionists out there, action breeds results. So it is easier to redirect an object in motion than it is a stationary one. So I would take a very good pass at your resume and I would circulate it. And you are now... Folks, you're selling yourself. You're marketing yourself. One of the biggest things in marketing is called split testing. And if you've never heard of that, it's basically you trying something, seeing if the, uh, seeing if the, uh, if it's working, and if, and then you start making tweaks, and you see if your tweak is working better. And then if your tweak is working better, you use that one. If it wasn't, then you go back to your original one. And you just look for the results. So if you're, Melvin, if you're, what I would do is I would keep a very uh, good listing of where you've circulated, which version of your resume, and just look at, let's call it the analytics, so to speak, and you're an IT guy, so you get this, and, and you know, which resume is working. But I, I'm all about getting it out and getting it, and by the way, I'm not advertising going and putting out a poor resume at all. What I really think you should do is take my workshop, work with me, and we'll get you one that hums. But, but I realize not everybody uh, has the time or the money to enroll in that. So I've got the free videos out there, I've got the templates, and I would just try to format it as I've suggested. And by, by the way, folks, and I, I, know, um, you know, I know some of you are new to me, but I am floored every day I get dozens of emails from people like you, new subscribers, old subscribers that have tried all kinds of ways to get their resume noticed and once they start watching my videos and start attending my workshop and things like that, they are getting instant and immediate results. And I'm not even talking about people that have enrolled in my, in my programs, I'm talking about people that just watch my YouTube videos and have taken my template. It really, really will help. So I hope that helps, uh, but to answer your question, I would never wait for perfection. I would I would make it good and I would get it out there and I would watch what happens and I would I would tinker with it. And I would and if you're in a very active job search where you're sending your resume out to a large number of places 
or a significant number of places, you're gonna have the data you need. Okay, Juan, is there a standard, okay, Juan, this is great. Is there a standard template you suggest for being effectively filtered by ATS? Juan, great question, two things you can do. Number one, use the template that's in the description here for the professional resume, that's number one. And number two, there is a website called JobScan that uh, I, I've, I've not used it, but a number of my students have used it and people who've been involved in these webinars have promoted it. Uh, it is a, uh, I think it's a free website. I, I think it's free. It's called JobScan, just Google it. And you can take your resume and put it in to the computer and you take the job description of the company that you're trying to submit your resume to and you can put that into the computer and it gives you some kind of match. And it says, you know, I don't know if it's like, you know, you're 86% of a match. And it, I think it gives you suggestions on how to be more aligned. And what that'll do is when a recruiter is reviewing it out of the ATS, you, you, your uh, resume will look more in line with what the job description is. So I think that that's, that's a way to go. All right, Shay, Jose, Shay, you're back. Hey, if you are not in my resume workshop, you are now for free. You have had perfect attendance at my live office hours and you are very active and I appreciate that. And I know Kara hates it when I do this, but we're gonna keep track and you just send me an email to support at milewalk.com and you give me your email address and we will set you up and we will send you a link for free and I hope you can attend the workshop next Wednesday. Here you are. I know you're a repeat attender because you ask me questions every time. I know you're a dog groomer because I love dogs. Transitioning in a nursing field, but I want to begin working in a medical setting. So how do you get an interview without direct experience? So if I remember correctly, Shay, and I don't know if you are in nursing school or if you are just, you want to get into hospitals or doctor's offices or places like that. Uh, if you are in nurse, I, by the way, I've helped a number of nurses who had a profession and then they later in their career, in their 40s and in their 50s, they went to nursing school and they wanted to be a nurse. And so we've helped them with their, with their resumes in that, in that transition. So I don't know, I can't, I can't remember if you are in nursing school or if you are simply just trying to get into the field and then get into school or something like that. But I would go back to what I mentioned to Oscar, I think it was, about changing careers and looking at the capabilities. And nurses are not just technically proficient, they are highly organized. They are good under duress and, and, and handle pressure well. There are, there are a lot of things. And, and so I would, I would talk to people in the nursing profession, ask them what those traits are that are most important to be successful as a nurse. Obviously, you need to be educated on medicine, but there are other things that you can highlight to break into that field, and you can express interest in your cover letters and other means uh, as you're applying to hospitals, if you want to look for administrative positions while you are going through school. Uh, I think that would be that would be helpful. And now you are a proud participant for free in my resume course. So uh, we can help you with that. All right. Oh, this is a great one. Please give me tips for a cover letter. This is AM underbar CFC blue. Uh, tips for a cover letter. Okay, that's a great one. And if you are if you are a new follower, I have uh, I have my actually my most watched video ever is called the four sentence cover letter that gets you the job interview. It is on my YouTube channel. It is six minutes and 13 seconds long. And I teach you the three goals of the cover letter and how to do that in four sentences. One other thing that, that I would also suggest you watch is I have a video called uh, it's Cover Letter Tips. It's uh, how to boss hunt with cover letters that make a heart melt. And there's two additional downloads, or two, one download with two additional cover letter samples. So if you just go to my YouTube channel and you look for cover letter tips on the front page, there is a playlist. There's, I think there's three videos. One is the four sentence cover letter, one is the boss hunting cover letter, and I would just watch it. But folks, to, to, answer, to answer his question here, don't overcomplicate anything, but definitely don't overcomplicate the cover letter. Employers, remember what I said, I don't know if you were here for the early part of the session. 
I'm looking at cover letters and resumes so fast. And a lot of times they're opening the resume first because they just want to get an idea of whether or not you fit. And a lot of times they don't read the cover letter. So if they do see the cover letter, they want it to be short and powerful. So you just, you want to let them know why you're reaching out to them. You want to know the value you can contribute and why you're aligned to the uh, position. If you know there is a position. And the third thing you want to do is thank them for their time and tell them you're looking forward to hearing from them or that you are open to any kind of conversation if they think you're a suitable fit for their company. I literally write the words for you. Just take the download, the four sentence cover letter. All right, Stephen Kimbrell. This is a great one. Okay, Stephen asked, at what point is it okay to follow up on a submitted resume? And if I don't know the hiring manager's name, what is the best way to address the email? So this is a great uh, question. It's a big problem for a lot of people. Now, on the first question, at what point is it okay to follow up on a submitted resume? If I'm, I'm going to give you a couple different answers. If you are sending your resume to a small organization, 100 to 500 people, one week, follow up one week later. If you are sending your resume to a very large organization, two weeks. If you have an indication from either their applicant tracking system, or I know I think LinkedIn does this, sometimes you can actually see the number of candidates who have applied for a particular position. If that number is really high, two weeks. Uh, but but that's a, an appropriate amount of time. And don't be discouraged if they do not get back to you. Depending on the urgency of the position, they may not even have looked at your resume. They might have looked at your resume and just did not want to respond to you. Appreciate that they're probably looking through a lot of resumes. It's not you, it's them, so to speak. Uh, or it is your resume, you didn't, it wasn't powerful enough. But that's, that's the answer to your first question. Second question is my first suggestion to how to address it is you can you can do a couple things here. You can really, really work hard to try to identify who to address it to. And there are many, many ways. And you can also, if you're sending an email, take a shot at who you are addressing it to. And you can also put in there, if I addressed it to an inappropriate person, I'm you know, my apologies, I, I did my best to try to discover who I should address this and send this to. If you have absolutely no clue, do not address it to dear sir or dear madam or anything like that. I would try to give a, a, uh, a generic name to uh, Mr. Hiring Official or Mr. Something Leader or something of that nature that is related to the position that you are uh, that you are looking for, or you can say uh, um, Mr. Human Resources Professional, or something that's a little more specific and not so generic, or dear hiring official, or whoever. If it uh, if it if it said a lot of times they'll tell you who to address it to or where to send it to. I would not be so hung up if what what you're going to call them. Really, what you want to do is you want to try to get that name uh, at all costs. And even if you address it incorrectly, but you give it a name, it'll find the right spot. So that's the most important thing. I think many times people put uh, great weight on being exactly right when they have to make assumptions about who to send it to and where it should go and so on. Don't get too, too hung up on that. That's the least of your problems. How you address it is, is truly the least of your problems. They're not going to be overly, over, over, overly concerned. All right, David. Oops, sorry. I think David is next. Uh, okay, David. You know what? You you are really dedicated, and I appreciate your emails, and I appreciate this. Let's give Kara. Let's give David access to the resume course if he is not already a student of that. And hopefully, you can meet us next Wednesday, the fourteenth, on um, in the program. So, how about that? All right, Andy, a while back, I came across a couple of articles about writing pain letters 
and human voiced resumes to replace writing standard cover letters and resumes. Have you heard about these? David, I have not. Uh, I'm not a big fan of, uh, I'm a huge fan of being human, uh, a human in the heart. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of trying to guess how the person's going to react if you are speculating as to how to how to package your your letter and your resume make it professional show your awesomeness keep your cover letters short and uh and that that's what i would say about that so no i have not heard of them and no i would not recommend them dan dan it's malet or malay is it only preferred that quantitative data be included in the bullet points or good to list something like negotiated contracts or should I add the number of contracts negotiated? Home run question, Dan, you get a free resume course too. Okay, so that is fantastic. All right, folks, this is really, really good. Every time you write a bullet of any kind in any place in the resume negotiated contracts sold products managed people uh, helped customers anything i want you to ask yourself this question think about what else would somebody want to know about this if you told me you'd negotiated contracts what would i ask you what the contracts do? Who'd you negotiate them with? How many of them did you do? In the year, the day, the week, the years, whatever. I'm gonna ask all those questions. So your bullet should say, negotiated contracts with 10 Fortune 500 clients, contracts ranged from 5 million to 50 million, and so on. I wanna know that. And if you don't know that, I would be shocked because anybody who negotiates contracts has some detail of the contract. So you need to make sure that you are asking yourself, what else would the person want to know? And until they can, until you can't ask yourself any more questions, then write the sentence, write the bullet. And one other thing, here's a little bonus pro tip. Always, always, if you can, put the value you contributed to the left left side of the bullet. So you want to say what the value was you contributed and then how you did that. So I would rather you say ne negotiated $100 million in contracts for my organization by doing what? Negotiating 10 uh, uh, contracts per week all year to Fortune 500 companies ranging from and so on. So they see the value on the left because a lot of times I won't read the whole sentence. Remember, people are scanning your resume. Nobody, and I mean nobody, reads a resume word for word. So the sooner you can get me to, I need to talk to this guy, that's the goal. It isn't to make me read your resume. For, yeah, actually, I want to digress here for one second. The number one goal of your resume is not to have someone read it. That may sound ridiculous, it's not. It's to get the person who opens it, hopefully it found itself into the right hands, is to say, I gotta speak to this person, live, on the phone, or in person. That's it, that's the goal of the resume. It isn't for me to spend 15 minutes reading a three-page resume. That's not what I'm gonna do. I wanna get to, I wanna talk to that guy. So Dan, make me talk to you and put those numbers in, negotiated contracts, bullet. All right. Hi, Sue. I've been a self-employed consultant and am looking to get a more stable income again. Even the idea of putting together a resume seems daunting. Where should I begin? Okay, so, and this is, this is great practice. So, Sue, hopefully you just heard me answer Dan. And one of the things that I mentioned to him was, you've got to ask yourself the questions that you think you're going to get asked. First thing I'm going to ask you is, 
How long have you, not that you needed to share this with me, but these are the kind of things to consider. How long have you been a consultant? How many companies have you worked for? What's the type of work that you do? How big are the projects? If you're a consultant, you're probably having some significant impact running projects, optimizing things, whatever it is, implementing technology, whatever it is that you do. And what I would do is if you, let's say, have been a consultant for the last five years, then I would just say between 2000 and... uh, 12 in 2017, I was Sue Inc. or LLC and was a business consultant who helped organization manage large scale, so on and so forth. Over this time, worked with 15 different companies, in, such as, and maybe you list the company names, or maybe you list if you have uh, uh, confidentiality agreements, you can't use their name, you know, large retail companies or whatever and then some of the highlights of what you did and make it like your consulting stint was a job was like a job with a company it was you were sole proprietary proprietor or sue inc or whatever it is so that's what i would do and then there are ways depending on how long you were a consultant to to package that and if it was a shorter period of time you might want to highlight what you did if you worked for three different companies over five years you might want to have three bullets and just talk about each one if you've worked for 20 companies over 10 years you're going to need to aggregate some of that in the detail of your resume but the place that i would begin is first off you can join the workshop that's great if you don't want to join my course and my workshop then what i would do is i would watch the how to build the ultimate professional resume video and there's a whole there's that one it also comes with the download of the template the professional template and use that and then i would format it accordingly but that's what i would do all right shay thumbs up you don't need to answer my (laughs) great to have you shay it really is um what is the web address again so oh job scan yes i think it so uh we were we were asking about um you know how to align uh, i think Juan or somebody was asking about how to align the resume more to the ats and what site you can use i think it might be jobscan.co i'm not sure but i think that might be it but it's if you just if you just google job scan it'll 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 come up Okay, yeah, there, oh, Mel- Melanie, thank you, Melanie. Melanie highlighted that. One, use the template from description, job scan. Okay, perfect. I'm. Hey, by the way, I love that you guys are helping each other out. That is a big part of being part of a community like this. I love having you people. I mean, I love doing these live sessions. I love all you folks that are on my email subscription list, and I love that you help each other. Uh, in the in the programs that I have, the training programs that I have, people are helping each other. I love that, and and please do that. All right, thank you. Uh, oh, hang on. Oh, sorry, it jumped, and I think I saw something from my wife. <laughs> All right, Carolina. Hi, Andy. How do I properly address a postgraduate study that isn't finished yet? So, Carolina, I think you mean. Uh, you you have a postgraduate study that you're doing. There is an expected date that you will finish, I'm assuming. This goes for anybody who's in school or in a program or an MBA or whatever. Expected date, you're going to graduate or finish. Expected graduation date, 2019. Expected completion date. 2019 or whatever it is. That's how I would address that. And if I did not if I did not answer you correctly, Hit me again. Juan, Carolina, what I suggest to use is an ex- Oh, he, yeah, Juan, man, you, you come. You're going to be my guest next week. Uh, I got some really good ones coming. All right, Thomas, my name is Jeff. All right, um, I'm not sure what that is. Okay, Leo. Hi, Andrew. I'm about to send my resume to a hiring manager, but there aren't any job openings. Without an objective, how can I let the hiring manager know what position I want? Leo, home run. Uh, Okay, home run question. Folks, this is awesome. I am so glad that Leo asked this question because a lot of you actually will apply 
to companies and you won't be sure that there's actually a job opening or you won't know what the job is. Do not hesitate. Never, never hesitate to send your resume to companies who are not advertising openings. It's okay. And in fact, I strongly, strongly encourage it. Okay. So number one, send them out, send them out, send them out, send them out. That's the first thing. Second thing is you're, if you're going to send it to a hiring manager, but there aren't any job openings, Leo, you're going to love me. The video that I mentioned, how to boss hunt with a cover letter that makes hearts melt. All you need to do, my friend, is go watch that video. Download the boss hunting cover letters. I have two of them. One is if you know there's a job that exists, and the second one is if you don't know if there's a job that exists or don't know the job description. So just take that. And then without an objective... How can I let the hiring manager know what position I want? And to answer to that question is when you send all people, when you send your resume to a company and you are not sure what the job is or what the job can be, or the fact that you just want to work with the company, tell them that I am, this is the value I bring. This is what I do. I am a killer IT professional who has done these architectures and so on. I would welcome the opportunity to speak with you about any position that in your organization that th you think would, I could be a good fit for or whatever. And what they will do is they will look at your resume and the value that you're bringing and the indication that you did some research and you know that this is what the company does. They're an engineering firm, they're a technology firm or whatever. And they're going to look at your background and then their wheels are going to start running. If you've optimized your resume and you put the cover or the career profile at the top like I mentioned and you put the career highlights in like I mentioned in the in the how to build the ultimate professional resume if they start to see what it is that you bring to the table they will start thinking forward and they will start imagining where you could fit in their organization trust me if you put the cover letter together correctly and you use my template the boss hunting one they will you will you will scoot them in the right direction I'm so can you tell I'm excited about that Okay, is it, all right, Hassania, is it true that I should make Mr. Resume, make Mr. Resume in PDF and not in Word if I send it in an email? That's a fantastic question. Always send it in a PDF. That way you know it will be opened without the person fearing of any viruses or whatever. And then, and then what I would do is if they, uh, you, what you could say is I've attached a PDF version of my resume. I would be happy to forward a Word document if you would prefer that. Keep in mind some of the applicant tracking systems or some of, uh, if you're emailing directly to a recruiter, hiring official, HR person, a lot of times the applicant tracking, they will have to move your resume into a tracking system. When they move it into a tracking system, sometimes they can do it right from your email and it will take your email and all your attachments and move them right in the system. Sometimes they need to open the resume and the, and the applicant tracking system needs to read the resume and index it and so on. There's many, many different kinds of, of tracking systems. Sometimes it's easier for them to use a Word document and if it is, believe me, they will tell you because they don't want to put it in in a PDF but let them, let them tell you that. But trust me, it's not gonna make any difference uh, if, they, if they like the quality of the content. If you've got a PDF, that's a safer way to go. David, you are welcome. Tamara, how are you? I hope all's going well. Hi, Andy, I've been revamping my resume based off of your template. I have also used JobScan. When I compare both, JobScan states that I should have communication and written verbal skills in my, uh, I'm, wait, I see another one from you. When I compare both, JobScan states that I should have communication and written and verbal skills in my resume. Is that necessary? So. Uh, couple, couple. That is a great question. By the way, Tamara, can you tell me which one of my courses you are in? Because I think uh, I don't know if you're in my resume course or my interviewing course, but whichever one you're not in, you can have for free. So, and you know how to reach me. Okay. So I don't. So, folks, I am as I stated earlier. I am not a big fan of 
just saying I have good written and oral communication skills. If job scan tells you that you need to highlight uh, written and verbal and communication skills, then what you need to do is, or what you can do, is put it in your resume, but then talk about how you gained those communication skills. So there is some way, shape, or form, Tamara, that you did that, and I will give you some exa- I'll give you some examples. Hey, if you're a speech writer, okay, that's cool, right? Or a marketer or whatever. But let's just say you're a project manager. And I, forgive me, I don't know what your profession is, but if you're a project manager, maybe you've developed excellent communication skills by interacting on a daily basis with your stakeholders to provide them status updates on a weekly basis in executive committees and so on. But state how you justify why you have those good skills. I have good written skills because I've written 25 different job uh, uh I don't know, pro formas or whatever, and just kind of quantify where you've gained that experience. And so, and then you kind of stick that in there somewhere. And I think that would help. I hope that helps. Folks, the, the, the moral of the story is you always want to justify why you think you have these particular skills. Otherwise, if you just tell me that you've managed five people, well, that tells me how many people you manage, but I don't know what you did for them. I mean, are these people, maybe all five of those people left because they hated you because you were a terrible boss. Well, did all five of those people get promoted within a year or two or on schedule promotions or whatever it is? So like, you always want to make sure that you are justifying what questions would somebody ask you about the bullets you're putting in there. Okay, wait, let me see. I, uh, I think, Tamara, I got that. And send me an email, and we'll get you in whatever you're not in. All right, Juan Hassani, is there a trade-off between PDF? A PDF is easier. That's great. Uh, for everybody, Linda Lasavita is my wife, and she can blow me kisses while we do this live. Okay, uh, Maureen, Maureen, how do I change my resume to fit a job description if they ask for experience in client care and experience in supply tracking, and I have experience in customer service and healthcare only. So if they are, so the first thing is, and this is, and and by the way, Maureen, I'm gonna make some uh, speculations here. And actually I wanna genericize your question for everybody because this is a really important thing for you to understand. When you look at a job description, most job descriptions are horribly written they list everything that they want the person to have or they're so thinly written that they don't list enough to give you an idea of why you would even want to work there. If you see job descriptions that are lengthy, that's lengthy. If you see job descriptions that are lengthy and they've got all these items listed that they want you to have experience in, keep in mind that they are listing their nirvana, their perfect person. So number one, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so, so concerned if you don't have all of the experience that they're looking for. Go ahead and apply anyway. If you can highlight how your, I think you said you have customer service experience and and healthcare experience, I would highlight how, uh, going back to my uh, response to Oscar earlier about what are the capabilities and highlight the capabilities that you've uh, developed through the customer service and healthcare experience that you have. And I'm assuming client care, there is some, there are customer service elements to that. There are healthcare services elements to that. Uh, supply tracking is a, a little bit more of an analytical function, but I would highlight you know, I would highlight how you develop those capabilities. And I don't know how you're applying if you're just sending your resume in an email and you get a chance to put a cover letter or an email together that can introduce some of these things in addition to having them on your resume, or if you're just putting it in an applicant tracking system. But those are the things that I would do to bolster uh, my, my credibility about why I am good for the job. Charles, how do I make my resume stand tall if I don't have much work experience? Charles, great question. If you don't have much work experience, I'm gonna go back to my response that I gave to Oscar earlier in the session. If you were not here for that, the great thing about these live office hours is they're all recorded and you wanna make sure that you're highlighting the capabilities. So you gotta find out 
what those capabilities are that make a good whatever it is you're applying to, and then highlight on your resume how you have those. All right, hey folks, just a 12-12 break here. Remember, if you enroll in the workshop and the course, the resume course, before I hang up today, I'm throwing in my interview intervention course for free. It's a $200 bonus that you can have for free. I guarantee you, you will slay your interviews. All right, let's go on. Thank you. Hassani, I, I'm hoping you're saying that to me. I think you love me so much. Thank you so much. I love having you. Carolina, Carolina uh, you're welcome. Tamara, Shea Jose, you can become CNA or LP. <laughs> I love that. Okay, visual moment. Hi, what to do for people that understand the language, but it's your third or fourth language, so you can do the job, but it's harder for you to write fluently is what I'm assuming you mean. So, uh, fact of the matter is, uh, I I love that you speak three or four languages, and I think that employers will value that. Anybody who can speak three or four languages, three or however many of them, are gonna be second languages to them. So, you certainly will be able to learn the language. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be overly concerned about that. I, I also think that that you have to consider uh, how much uh, communication is required for you to be successful in those roles. And I might not jump into ones where the degree of communication is so high that you could you you could have a difficult time early on, but ones that you might be able to ramp up your communication skills. But I love that, and I you know kudos to you. Tamara, you're in. Andy, in the past, interviewers have asked me what the company uh, I've worked for. I thought about putting a brief description about the organization underneath the company name. David, yes, look at the ultimate resume template, and you're going to be in the resume course, and I lay it all out for you, and you definitely should have a description underneath the company name. Don't assume everybody knows. Asania, uh, let me see here. Oops, sorry, guys. I send a cover letter and resume to Peace Corps Morocco for language cross-culture facilitator, and I have an interview soon. Please, is there any advice, and what should I focus about? So one of the things that I would do, and by the way, folks, I, I you know, my interview intervention course is awesome. It teaches you everything you need to know about interviewing and how to nail any job interview. If you don't want to enroll in the course, I have other options. You could buy the book for three or four bucks on Amazon, just get the PDF. I have a $27 book experience where you get the book, the ebook, the audio, all my chapter notes and guides and templates and so on. That's on the Mile Walk Academy. And so what I would suggest is, um, and because your, your, your question is quite broad there, on any interview, no matter what the job is, I would read that book. I would read Interview Intervention. You will be so much more prepared for your job interview that book, it's we are having the we just passed the five year anniversary for that book. It's been read by more than a hundred thousand people. It is it is really really helpful, and I think you'll get an, an awful lot out of it. And anybody that has a, a high degree of communication in their job, speechwriters, marketers, salespeople, and so on, interview intervention is an interpersonal communication book. It happens to be written in a job interview setting. So even if you're not, you know, even if you think you got interviewing down, it will really, really help you in your in your job function. Okay, uh, Nafisa, I think I said that correctly. Hello, everyone. Thank you for your nice piece of advice, Mr. Andrew. Joined in now, but we'll watch the recording. Okay, one. I think I'm. Kara, help me out here. It looks like I am down. Uh, do I have some additional questions? Uh, but we're getting we're getting close to having to wrap it up. So one thing I wanna do, if you are on the fence, all my programs have a 30 day money back guarantee. I would check out that resume course and the workshop for that course is June 14th, it's next week. Anybody who enrolls before I hang up, I'm throwing in my $200 interview intervention course. And if you have any questions, support at malwalk.com and I will be happy to throw it in. So let me, let me get down to these last few. Uh, let me see. Any advice you have for physicians applying for training? Yes, that's a great question. So the question is, uh, Nafisa, I think that's how you spell it or sound or uh, say it. 
is a physician and wants to be a trainer. So what now, all salespeople are not great sales coaches. All physicians are not great teachers. And a lot of people that can do their job function well don't necessarily make great trainers or teachers. So one of the things that you need to do is you need to highlight how and why you're gonna be an effective trainer. Now, one of the things that you absolutely can, can speak to is your, uh, your experience and your knowledge in the areas that you're teaching. So whatever credentials you have for whatever it is you're teaching. So when I teach about job searching and interviewing and so on, I have decades of experience studying this stuff every single day. I've written three books. I speak to millions of people. I, those are credentials. You are you have those credentials in your space. And if you're if you're considering training, you better know what you're talking about. So highlight that stuff. Highlight how you've worked with people. Have you had proteges before? Have uh, have you had interns or other people that you've trained? So it's hard without knowing specifically what you've done, but you want to highlight all those things that would make a good trainer. Those capabilities that go with a good trainer. All right, Della Fury. Hi, Andy. Any tips on how to write a resume if you're looking to make a career change? Della, I went through that uh, earlier in the program. So uh, I believe it was Oscar who asked me that. I went in, I spent 10 minutes talking about that. I would definitely look back at that if you just if you just joined. I don't know when you popped this question in, but there's tons of experience. And by, by the way, folks, just so you know, uh, if you are not on my YouTube subscription and my Tips for Work and Life blog subscription, subscribe because I'm actually, I put new videos out every Tuesday morning at 6.30 Central Time and I've got some coming up on changing jobs, on what to put on your resume when you haven't, when you want to change jobs, what to put on your resume when you have no skills, all these things you're asking me, you are the best source of insight for me and how I create the content or how I come up with the content that I shoot for you, that I write for you, that I, that I record the podcasts for you. So I hope that helps. I have ga- okay, Shelly. I have gaps in my work history and was suggested to use a functional resume versus a traditional resume. What does that look like? Shelly, just say no. Do not, do not, everybody, do not put a functional resume together. I don't know who gave you that advice. It's terrible. And I know that because of my own experience and the surveys I've done with HR and recruiting professionals, 79% of them said they won't even read a functional resume and the other 21% that will don't like them. And I'll tell you why they don't like them. People think in terms of time. The first question I'm gonna ask you is where do you work now? After I glance through your resume, I wanna know where do you work now or where, do you, where did you work most recently? If you have gaps in your resume, that's okay. You don't, on the resume themselves, you don't have to accommodate for those. If you perform volunteer work or if you were a stay-at-home uh, mom or whatever it is and you had other things, or maybe you just had gaps in your history, that's fine. Explain them live. Don't put them on the, I mean, you don't need to twist around and make your resume a pretzel uh, that, that people are not going to want to read. And a functional resume, if you're wondering what that looks like, it, and I, I don't know if you were here for the beginning portion when I told you how my eyes go through the resume. If you were not, I, Shelly, I would definitely go back to the beginning uh, when the recording is, is finished and I would watch it. But I look down the left column, I'm looking for companies that you work for. If I look down the left column of your, the first page of your resume and I, a functional resume has your job function and then on the right side of the resume, it has the companies you performed that function at. And if I have to build my own story of your timeline, I won't do it. So I just throw it in the garbage right away. And most, and I don't know how many, I know we got a lot of job seekers on this, uh, on this webcast. I don't know how many hiring officials or HR people or recruiters, but I guarantee you every time we do, I do one of my live webinars, they say the same thing. And I just, I would stay away from that. Strongly stay away from that. Leo, will will I increase my chances by sending my cover letter and resume to a hiring manager via post then email? So that is a fantastic question. Leo, you got some great ones today. One of the things that 
I think is important for everybody to understand. Getting your resume in front of a hiring official who is likely in pain because they need Leo, right? They need Leo. That hiring official is going to give that resume some attention. Now, when people used to send resumes to me when I worked for corporations and I was not in a hire, I was not an HR department. I actually was an executive who ran a unit. I loved getting those resumes and I would open them up and then I would send them on to HR and I would say, hey, we need to interview this guy or gal. So, and then some of them might just reply back to you and say, hey, you need to send your resume to so-and-so in HR. That's fine too. Or put it in the ATS system or fine. But if you can get your resume in the inbox of the most important person in relation to that function or job, that's good. And by the way, I have a, uh, a blog post. Uh, I wrote it a while back uh, called How to Break uh, the Rules When You Job Search or something like that or Overcoming the ATS. If you s search the Milewalk blog, it's on milewalk.com, uh, My Tips for Working Life blog, and you just put ATS in the search bar, I think the, the write-up will come up and it's pretty cool and you should check it out. And I even put language in there about how to address the messages. Okay, Juan, how would it... Uh, how would I add a profile to include a video resume in the application? Juan, don't include a video resume unless they ask you for one. And if you want to include a video, I would put a link in your, uh, in your resume to the video that should be hosted somewhere else. Uh, actually, you could even put it in, um, in PDFs. You can put them in there, but I, I wouldn't do it. I would, I would link them out to another site. Della Great, uh, let's see, pronounced correctly. Yay, that's Nafisa. Thanks for the above. I can use this advice for teaching experience. However, I am out of medical school. We need training before we can practice in the US. Uh, I will be the trainee. That's awesome. Lots of luck to you, uh, for sure. How do I, uh, let's see, Zainab. How can you address a layoff from the last position? Can you resubmit a revised resume for the same position? So, two questions, and one of the things that, uh, that I would do, any of you that are, have gaps in your resume, whether it's right now and you're looking, or somewhere along the way, first thing, don't worry, don't worry. I'm telling you, don't panic. If you've got good work experience and you're a good person, you will find the right company who will overlook your let go, your layoff, or whatever. The most important thing is to make sure that if you uh, were let go, that you can articulate it effectively as to what happened and what transpired. So the addressing of the layoff in your last position on your resume, you're not going to say anything about it. It'll just say, you know, I worked at company XYZ from 2012 to 2017 and I'm done. That's fine. What they're going to do is they're going to ask you what happened when you when you get into the job interview. And what you want to do when you get into the job interview is you want to use very, very positive language about what transpired. And you want to tell your story in a manner that says, you know what, I, I, I was let go. And, and by the way, when you are let go, I don't care what the reason is, you need to take responsibility. The organization who is looking to hire you wants to hear from you that you own your situation. There's many, many reasons why uh, people get let go. Sometimes there's simply a reduction in force. Had nothing to do with you. Your unit was retired, meaning you know this company let go 4,000 people and you were one of them. That's fine. Just tell the story. Say, I was part of a large reduction in force, but I'm excited because it gave me the opportunity to really think about what I want to do, target the right types of organizations, I'm excited, and so on. Just be positive about it. If you were fired for cause, what was the particular situation? And explain what you've learned and that you're excited for your new search. Just be very, very positive. You just don't want to badmouth the employer. Can you resubmit a revised resume for the same position? Sure you can. I would let you know a few weeks or a month go by before I did that. Leo, you're welcome. Uh, Zaina, you are not bombarding me. You never have to apologize. That's what these sessions are for. Okay, folks, that was almost 90 minutes minus a little technical glitch somewhere in there. 
So I am about to let this let this program go, but I do want to I do want to say one thing. Uh, check out the resume list on the YouTube channel. Subscribe to my Tips for Working Life blog so you can stay up to date. I release new content every Tuesday on everything: career development, job searching, resume writing, you name job interviewing, you name it. The other thing is, if you love this, give me a like. Give me a comment, give me a share, help circulate this so other people can benefit. They can't take advantage of my interview intervention bonus. I hope you guys jump in on that uh, with, the, with the resume course. If you enroll in the resume course, I'll throw it in here. If you can get in there before 1230 uh, central time in the US. But until next week, I've got some great stuff coming. I've got an 11 o'clock session in, in the US next week, this same spot. So hopefully you can attend that. Those of you that are on my YouTube channel will be notified. Those of you that are on my Tips for Work and Life subscription list, you'll get the email alerts about the topics. And if there's anything that you want to cover or you want me to cover, maybe we'll do changing careers a little bit more next week. But uh, but until then, I hope you have a great one. I want to congratulate you for sticking with me and really helping yourself by taking in this insight. And hopefully I, I gave you some good pointers for your job search and, and the journey that you're on. But I wish you loads of luck until next week. Have a great one.